Morning, everyone. Hopefully, everybody's uh, feeling bright-eyed and bushy-tailed this morning. So, my name's David. I work with uh, a few of the other guys over in Dublin. We're part of the Network Infrastructure Engineering Team, which more traditionally would be more of kind of the operations role, much like Phil just discussed. Within Facebook infrastructure, and more specifically, Facebook network engineering, we like to say that we run a zero-impact network. It's all well and good, but what the hell does that actually mean? Well, in theory, if we're doing our job well and noticing issues and fixing them quickly, in theory, you guys should never actually see it as users. So today, we're going to talk about some numbers of scale, some of our tooling, which we dubbed FDN for anybody playing buzzword bingo, um, some real-world tales, some lessons we've learned, and then some Q&A which we should have time for at the end. So scale. There are more than one and a half billion people that use the site every single month, and actually over a billion now use that site every single day, which is cool, but at the same time, I think one of the more interesting numbers is that actually more than 80% of those are actually outside of the US and Canada, which truly does mean that we have a truly global network and it stretches to all four corners of the Earth. But what it actually means for our traffic is that we have a lot of it. So if we look at this graph, which is a pretty basic traffic graph over a period of, say, 12 to 18 months, along the bottom we can see machine-to-user traffic, along the top machine-to-machine -machine traffic. Now, whereas machine-to-user traffic is growing, it's, it's pretty predictable. You know, we, we know that oh, for a number of users we're going to add this much bandwidth, and things are pretty easy to deal with. Machine-to-machine -machine traffic, however, is growing exponentially. As we continue to add more and more services that are more and more rich and need to talk to more and more machines to, to deliver that to you, it's growing. And it's a problem that you know, usually would, would definitely kick us in the ass. So at Facebook, we like to say that in theory, we don't actually run the network. We build robots, and then we train the robots to actually run that for us. So we're going to talk today about some of the actual automation that helped us get to there. So, Facebook defined networking. If we look at this scary looking diagram, you're going to see lots of words that you have no idea what they mean because they're all internal project names. But there's some recognizable names such as Syslog and SNMP and things like that. I'd love to go into more of the detail about every one of those, but we really don't have time today. But if you want to know anything, then catch me afterwards. So, FBNet. FBNet is a database which allows us to model as everything inside the network. We can model devices, line cards in those devices, ports on those line cards, circuits between those line cards and other line cards, BGP neighbors, MPLS LSPs, operational data such as is an interface up, things like that. And it truly allows us to recreate the network from the ground up if we should ever lose it. We have drain services, which are things that, and tools and scripts and other things cobbled together that allow us to move traffic away from devices, both in the data center and in the backbone, for instance, if there's maintenance or if there's an issue on them. We have NetNORAD, which is a mesh of machines spread all over the Facebook network, which sends multiple different traffic classes continuously over the network to be able to detect latency and packet loss, both at a cluster-to-cluster -cluster level and a data center, data center, region-to-region, -region, so on and so forth. We have Megazord, which is a tool which basically allows us to take multiple different alarms for multiple different things and correlate them into a single alarm that we know things about it. Such as, say, a, a switch goes down. Everything that peers with that switch, say via BGP, is also going to report an alert. Now, usually you'd be left with, say, 50 alerts saying, hey, this guy's down. Well, instead, we get one alert to say, this guy's down and all of his BGP neighbors know about it. So if we go back to this scary-looking diagram, on the left-hand side, we can see that we have the sources of the information. Things like FBNet that I mentioned, Syslog and SNMP traps, which everybody knows about, and ODS, which is our live key-value data store, which stores things such as the amount of traffic going through an interface, CRCs on a link, things like that. And on the right-hand side, we have the consumers of that, such as Megazord. So I promise you tales. And let's talk about circuits. Now, anybody, and a lot of you here will, if you operate circuits at any kind of scale, or even if it's not any scale at all, you start off with the very manual approach. You know, you get an email from your vendor saying, hey, we're going to do some maintenance on this circuit. So you go, cool. So you set your alarm for 2 a.m. and you get up and, you know, you move traffic away from that link. You know, maybe you increase your OSPF costs or whatever. Then they do the maintenance and they say everything's complete and you, you, you look at everything and you make sure it's up and there's no errors on it. And then you move traffic back and you go back to bed and everybody's good. That works fine when you've got 1, 10, 50, 
maybe even 100 circuits, but it doesn't continue to scale. So we move on to more of like a hybrid approach. So we use some of the toolings that I already talked about, such as you know, the drain tools, which allow us to auth automate it, take traffic away and put it back on. But still, there's a guy hitting the button to make it drain and hitting a button to bring it back. So what did we actually do? Well, we took that approach and instead trained the robots to do it so that it's fully automatic. So let's say we receive a notification from a vendor. We'll take that email and we'll pass using lots and lots of horrible regexes because no single vendor likes to send you an email in the same format every time uh, to get all the information regarding that, such as the circuit, the time it's going to go down, whether we can you know, expect it to actually go down or non-service affecting, which I swear is something that never actually happens. And we create a task. That task is used internally for able to be able to talk between teams if we have to regarding it. You know, say we need to go and check light levels. It can all be, we can all collaborate inside that task. And we use a tool called Poltergeist, which is basically just a cron tab on steroids, which is able to go and look at those tasks and say, okay, two hours before that maintenance starts, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna move traffic away from that link. It uses the drain tools to do that. And then once the maintenance has ended, it again, calls the undrain. As part of that undrain, it's also going on there. It's checking, is everything up? Are there any errors on the link before it actually puts traffic back on it? And everything's back in production. Now, that's brilliant when you know exactly what's going to happen, but what if you don't? That would be an awesome video. You have to trust me on that. If you want to download the keynote, you can see it's a video. Um, so, so, let's say we get a number of links that go down due to fiber cut. Megazord takes those alarms and it groups them on things that we know from taking it from FBNet, such as who is the vendor for that circuit, where does it go from, where does it go to, and it groups that into a single alarm so we can say, hey, vendor X has got a fiber cut between these two places. We put that into a database which we called OpperDB, which is just a database within FBNet for storing things like fiber cuts, events, things like that. And we check FBNet to see how that vendor actually wants to be communicated with. Is it via email? Is it an API that we've got with them? Or in some cases, which is still horrible, there are some vendors that require you to actually pick up a phone, which is horrible. But, and again, we create a task because we love tasks. So we contact the vendor, let's say this is via email, which hopefully is the case. Once the links have come back and everything's okay, we don't straight away put traffic back on there because as everybody knows, you, know, you look at a link and you go, yes, it's fixed, and then five minutes later it goes back down. So we instead leave a window of, say, 12 hours when we just monitor it and make sure nothing goes wrong. And then once that's completed, then we email the vendor and say, everything's cool, thanks very much, send us an RFO, why did it go down? Cool. So this scary-looking graph is something a little more different, and it's something we lovingly internally called the memory leak debacle. Now, this is a period over, say, four months, and this is a graph here of free memory on some of our core routers. Now, as you can see, it trends down and down and down, and to the point where if we didn't actually step in and apply a workaround, the devices would have become unusable. They would have stopped responding, we wouldn't have been able to get onto them, maybe they start dropping packets, maybe they even start affecting other devices around them. Not very nice. Now, in the old world, how would you actually get around this problem? Because as you can see, it took the vendor more than you know, a period of four months to fix this. Well, in the old days, you'd just have lots of engineers and lots of coffee. But again, we decided to make a robot and train it to do this instead. So we have ODS, which as I mentioned is our key value data store, which as well as traf storing things like the traffic through an interface, also stores things like the amount of free memory on a device. We have these detectors which allow us to trigger alarms when certain thresholds are meet. So when the memory goes below a certain thing, when you know, a certain criteria is met. So that raises an alarm so that we know about it. FBAR, which some of you may have seen a presentation on before, is our automated human which basically steps in and is able to do a series of things to try and remediate that. What it does is it checks to see is the capacity in the network, is, you know, can I take this out of service safely? You know, is the backup controller inside that device safe? Is there enough capacity? If that's the case, we call the good old drainer and we move traffic away from that device. Because yes, in theory, you should be able to fail over between the CPUs in these devices, completely hitless, but we all know how hitless upgrades and hitless things like that go. So once we've done that, we reload the active CPU, and the standby CPU takes over. Again, once that new standby has come back up, 
we reboot again. So we've rebooted both CPUs in, in tandem there. Once redundancy is restored, we go on there, we check in, in theory the memory usage is back up at a nice peak level, everything's good, and we use the drainers to move traffic back onto there, which is cool. So coming back to that diagram again, and let's give some actual numbers to this to show kind of like what kind of scale we're operating at. So in a period of 30 days, Emido, which is our system which is responsible for taking those syslogs and SNMP alarms and actually processing them into alarms, has over 3 billion notifications. But less than 1% of those are actually translated into real alarms. So it kind of shows how noisy network devices are with absolutely useless log messages. FBAR, which as I mentioned is our automated human, acts over 750,000 times on alarms, which is something that usually an engineer would have to do themselves but less than 1% of those actually end up in real alarms that actually go to a real human. Carrier maintenance, which is the system where I talked about where you, know, you get an email and you drain circuits when there's maintenance is on them, acts on over 300 in a month. And vendors, which is the one with the shark eating the fiber, acts on over 1,100. Megazord, which, as I mentioned earlier, that acts on over thousands and thousands and thousands of alarms and correlates them down into, I say, just 1,200 unique alarms, which then things like FBAR can take and go and act on them. So where does this get us? Well, in theory, we're going towards having a single on-call engineer in charge of the network at any one time. Now, we'd like to move even further forward and have no engineers looking at the network at any one time and just having them be paged, which is something we're trying to get to. So what are some of the lessons that we've learned whilst we've been working on this? Well, the first one is to reuse code wherever possible. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, some like companies, some people out there have a not built here syndrome. You know, as soon as they come on board, they, they find a new problem and they build something from scratch. That's not always the best case solution. Within Facebook, we have a number of things like FBAR, which initially was actually made for the server guys to re you know, remediate things like hard drives failing. Well, we took that, we adapted it for use in the network world because network devices are a bit different and now we use that. Another example is Megazord. That was originally created by ourselves for networking devices, but afterwards, when we actually kind of documented it and released it to internally, the, the database team were able to see it and think, well, yeah, we have a similar problem to that. So they used it internally as well, rather than recreating the same thing again. Number two is that hacks quickly become important tools. Whenever there's something going wrong in the network, you know, somebody's always gonna be spinning up a quick Python script or a quick bash script to, you know, look at a number of things. Those quickly become the services that you use day in, day out. So another thing is instrument and unit test everything that you have. We try and at Facebook have no code owners. So what that means is if I make a service in theory, I don't have to be there to bug fix, feature fix, and things like that. We encourage people to go and do that themselves. And also there's no guarantee that that person is still gonna be at the company in six months. Even if you're the one that's only ever going to be looking at that code, it's always nice to six months down the line, instead of looking at your own code and going, why the hell did I use that on? What, what am I actually trying to do there? You documented it, in theory, that shouldn't be a problem. Poke for feedback often. Even though we might not be the ones that actually use the tools we create every day, it might be the guys in the data center, it might be the guys out in POPs doing deployments. We had issues where a number of things happened, where, for instance, drains weren't done properly, and we're looking at it and we go, why did the drain tools do this? Well, it turns out the drain tools hadn't actually been used and somebody had gone in there and manually drained it in the old fashioned way. And when we said, hey, what, you know, why, was, why was this done in this way? He came back and he said, well, I, I don't use the drain tools because you see they're too slow for me. It takes double the amount of time. Oh, that's not great. Well, what part is slow? He comes back and he shows us and we go, oh, well, you know, we need to fix that. But that's something that you need to Always be talking to your end users or else you're never actually going to be able to see that these things are not working correctly. Networking devices don't have powerful CPUs. Now, we live in the server world now where you know, have multiples of cores, gigabytes and gigabytes of memory, terabytes of storage, awesome. Networking devices, you're lucky if you have one CPU. Maybe two CPUs. Single core? Mm, maybe, yeah, you might have dual core. But still, they're nowhere near as powerful. So when you're doing things to try and get more and more data because everybody loves data, be aware of the CPU on these things isn't as powerful as you might hope. The sooner the robots take over, the better. Now, yes, we could continue scaling the network and just continue throwing more and more network engineers into the pile and say, hey, look, we can scale. But at the end of the day, 
it's, it's better instead to, as we do, build the robots and then we can just have, keep the team small and you know, make it a lot more flowing. Talk is cheap, focus on impact. Whilst we in Facebook we have an internal culture of trying to make it so that if you see a problem with something, go and fix it. Just because you, you know, might not be the guy who originally made it, get in there, fix it yourself, nobody's going to moan at you for doing that. Which kind of leads into the last one, which is done is better than perfect. Now this is something that we say, you know, we'd rather ship early and ship often. You can, sure, you can sit in a room for six months and whiteboard something out, but at the end of the day, it's better to get a product out there and then discover the little bugs that might be in it, rather than launching after six months and finding the huge hole that you didn't think of. So, this journey really is 1% finished, and I'll just kind of fast forward through this. Uh, some people will have seen that we've released uh, the hardware specs for our top of rack switches and also the, the operating system in that, and also making that into more of a chassis. Um, we're trying to operationalize that to make sure that we've got complete parity with the current vendor solutions. Bridging the world in between optical and IP. Historically, these things are some things that are completely done in different organizations within a company, you know, completely unlinked. Try and get those into the same world because at the end of the day, one relies on the other. PCE, so also known as SDN, OpenFlow, as Phil mentioned, and other things like that. Try and get into path computation elements so that we can actually take the switches and routers are brilliant, but they kind of have got this very narrow view of the world. Get that in, get into a controller so that we're, yeah, can take the, the thinking away from the devices. And of course, continuous development of our existing tools. So, thanks very much for your time this morning, and I'd like to leave you with one question, which is, what would you do if you weren't afraid? So, any questions? That's always good, I like that. Feel free to come and catch me when, during the coffee break if you've got any questions that you didn't want to ask. Oh, okay, Nat. Uh, Nat Morris, uh, Netflix X Cumulus. Um, I've been following your stuff and closely working with people who are doing stuff with the wedge and the um, six pack. Mm -hmm. Do you have? I saw WDM mentioned on your slide. Do you have plans to uh, submit any WDM hardware to the Open Compute project? At the moment, there is nothing submitted. Um, however, you know, as we continue, it's it's. Pretty expected that, yeah, we eventually will get into that. But okay. at the moment, no. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. I'll uh, leave you to your coffee break.